Well, spring is most certainly with us. And usually at this time of year, we turn our attention to our own gardens and the green spaces that surround us. But actually, what steps can we take to attract more wildlife and improve the biodiversity on our own doorsteps? Well, Dr. Phoebe Carter, who's based in the Cotswolds, may have some of the answers. She's a, an expert and a Cotswold girl, Phoebe, I think I'm right in saying. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Childhood uh, growing up in the Rissingtons. Um, and now I live in another part of um, the Cotswolds over towards Tetbury. But um, yeah, so I've had a, a really nice time um, sort of in such a beautiful county. Absolutely right. So you spent, I mean, I assume uh, we always think of the summers in the old days or when we were younger, sorry, I should say, being long and hot. They probably weren't. But I mean, you spent a lot of time outside, presumably playing and looking and discovering. Uh, stuff. Yeah. Well, we did, yeah, we didn't have um, very much else to do, did we? So we were kind of thrown outside and came home for dinners. Um, and the rest of the time, you sort of entertained yourselves making dens, yeah. looking for wildlife, looking for hedgehogs, um, making homes for hedgehogs. We just, yeah, we just spent a lot of time outdoors, which I think is different to, to children nowadays, really. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's obviously given you a passion for it. But let's start with this sort of topic about of biodiversity. I have to say it's one of those subjects like climate change that is very much very topical, far more topical now than it has been for a long time, but we can't escape from the, the horror stories of, you know, species disappearing and um, environments disappearing. So, you know, wh wh where, where do you, where are you at at the moment with that, with those two points? Yeah, I mean, we are in an ecological emergency. Um, and I think what we've got to remember is that the environment um, and ecology underpins absolutely everything else, um, including sort of the, the climate crisis. And it's a bit sort of, I suppose it's a bit twee, isn't it, to say that we depend so much on nature, but we really do, you know, um, clean water, oxygen, everything, um, the food we eat, the pollinators that we need to pollinate the, the crops that we need um, to eat, everything sort of boils down to nature. And we've kind of been overlooking it for far too long. So now that it is sort of getting into mainstream media, it's brilliant. And, and we need everyone to sort of, um, you know, keep up the pressure um, on how important it is that, that we um, start protecting it and looking after it um, better than we have been um, and that means that we do get sort of you know need to get those in power listening to us as well because it's all well and good having something like the COP26 coming up but um, you know I don't know how many people think that that's going to sort of produce anything useful we've been doing a lot of talking for a long time um, but not enough action. It's about, I mean, you know there are two elements there really aren't there's that there's from your point of view I would suggest you know lobbying Parliament and the power, the powers that be across the world, not just in the UK, I have to say. But then equally, on the other side of it, is that we, uh, you and I, in our back gardens, can make a difference. So, uh, you know, there are two very different things. Is um, what I hope people don't think. Oh, biodiversity, I can't do anything about it. You know what I mean? Well, we can do something about it, can't we? Absolutely. And I think that's the thing. I think sometimes you look at everything and it is so overwhelming that you think, what's the point in even trying? But actually, if we all just do little steps, take little steps in our own gardens, in the way uh, we approach life, all those little steps added together, um, you know, amount to enough to start making a difference. In the UK, what are the species that we are in danger of losing uh, at the moment? Well, it depends. I mean, there's a lot. Um, so a lot of the pollinators, uh, we're struggling to keep a lot of our pollinators. It's not just bees. We, um, a lot of the other insects um, are pollinators, butterflies, beetles. We're at risk of losing those to pesticides and herbicide use. Um, a lot of the birds that, that we would have thought were common sort of in childhood um, are now sort of red listed. Things like the house sparrow is now red listed. Um, a lot, a lot of things like swallows and swifts at this time of the year that we're waiting for mm. the house martins. They're coming back in lower and lower numbers often because they're fighting a losing battle on their migratory routes. Um, and when they get here, you know, there's loss of habitat um, for their nesting sites and also not enough of their invertebrate prey that they rely on because we are sort of overusing some of these um, chemicals. Mm. Uh, if um... You know, you must get asked this question hundreds of times a year. I mean, what are the pr practical steps that people can in the, you know, the average house back garden or front garden? What, what can we do that, that might help those, those, those animals? I think, I think it is thinking about the invertebrates. They are sort of at the, the bottom of that food chain and they impact on so many other species. So bats will eat them, birds will eat them. 
um, it's it's so important to look after to look after those. And so you can do that by um, leaving some grass longer, not mowing your lawn every week, maybe doing it every two weeks, maybe trying to leave an area um, unmown all year until September, and then you cut it and clear it in September. And that provides long grasses for lots of invertebrates. Um, you can plant uh, wildflowers, um, lots of native wildflower species um, that our pollinating insects are, are sort of used to uh, know how to feed from. So native species are really good. Um, you can make a log pile in your garden that encourages lots of sort of dead wood invertebrates. With those dead wood invertebrates and the slugs and the snails that might go in those, then you'll get sort of amphibians and reptiles using them. Then you're creating um, some food for um, species like hedgehogs. That's another one that's massively endangered and we're at risk of um, losing a hedge, uh, sort of hedgehogs. I mean, who would have thought years ago that hedgehogs were on the verge of extinction? Yeah. So that's really important. So, um, so it's really sort of trying to create sort of a whole um, range of micro habitats. So tiny different habitats within your garden, which means it doesn't matter what size your garden is. You can have an area of wildflowers. Um, you could have a, a tiny little Tupperware pot that you've sunk into the ground as a pond. Um, and you'll be amazed at what comes along and will start using um, that. So it's just creating lots of little patchwork um, sort of within your garden and if you haven't got a garden you've got a window box you can still plant um, wildflowers or herbs in there that will attract sort of um, some of the insects as well. Do you think um, schools and um, the education system is wised up to this to use a horrible phrase but you know what I mean Are, you know is the education system doing enough to, to get the me that message out? I think it's changing. So it is getting a bit better. Now we've got forest schools um, and lots of schools do have sort of forest school sessions. And that's great. I don't think we're doing enough to address it in um, lessons. I still believe we should be doing something along the lines of a natural history GCSE, which I think they've been discussing at some point. We've lost that sort of connection to nature. And, and part of that is from that loss of connection at sort of school age um, and we need to sort of embrace that again. And part of that is, as you say, bringing it back into the classroom. OK, and um, I know there are a couple of things that you're particularly hot on at the moment. One is AstroTurf, which I understand you're not a fan of. No, I'm not. I do. I do appreciate it has it. It's it's um, it has a, a certain sort of um, place. Um, but, you know, I think so many people are turf, AstroTurfing over their their gardens to make it easier for themselves but actually what you've got to think about is that that astroturf is just a complete barrier to any wildlife that's living in the soil and therefore you're blocking anything getting out of the soil and coming onto the lawn and therefore you're stopping anything else visiting um your garden it, it's basically creating a, a desert um yeah. an ecological desert i'm just thinking about uh, sorry to interrupt you there about the uh, what you're just saying about the astroturf blocking the soils how are invertebrates coping at the moment? I mean, we've had a very dry spring and a very cold April. I mean, this is a key time for them, isn't it? Um, so, you know, how are they coping with the weather we've been having? It is, I think, I think, yeah, those two things, the coldness, um, everything sort of, it's setting everything back. So I think you'll probably notice, you know, compared to last year when the gardens were buzzing and alive at this time of year, that there's very little around at the minute, which does then have that knock on impact on all the other species as well. And also, you know, the ground is so dry, so lots of stuff. Um, so hedgehogs are struggling to find food. So you can put out sort of some dried cat food for your hedgehogs at the minute because they really are struggling, um, along with a dish of water. Um, because things like their slugs and snails that they eat, they're, they're not really coming out because it's too dry. And badgers are struggling as well because normally they 70% um, of their diet is earthworms, but they can't dig down deep enough to, to get the earthworms at the minute. So, yeah, so a lot of things are really struggling. I'm wondering whether with things like, I mean, every part of Gloucestershire is witnessing a, um, an explosion in house building. I wonder whether things like, well, the other topic I know that you're particularly keen on at the moment are these hedgehog highways. I mean, you know, is there not a chance that developers could be encouraged to sort of leave a little portal in, in the fences or, you know, encourage uh, new buyers of properties to actually group together to create a sort of a, you know, a Facebook group for biodiversity on this new estate you know is is that a sort of thing that might might work yeah so so part of part of what i do is is working with developers to try um and encourage them to be sort of nature inclusive and yeah hedgehog highways is a really simple thing we're, we're just getting into this um 
th this kind of mind zone where, where we fence ourselves into our little kingdoms and we're fencing wildlife out with that. It's so simple, like you said, to leave a small, it's like a 13 centimetre diameter hole which allows hedgehogs and other wildlife, small wildlife to pass into your garden and access your garden. If we build these houses and we don't allow any access into these um, gardens, and we really are, um, you know, we are becoming nature exclusive and we can't keep doing that. We can't keep just building developments and then giving them names that are based on wildlife, but we've actually obliterated all the wildlife around it. So it's about working together and building with nature. OK, well, we wish you well with that, Phoebe. And uh, as always on these little chats, we try and end with some guidance as to where people can go for advice uh, in the hope that they've been inspired by what you've said. So uh, where, where's the, do you have your own website, for instance? Yes, I do. Yeah, you can um, look me up on the biodiv uh, sorry, biodiversitymatters.co.uk. Um, and there's some information um, on there. You can get in touch with me. I'm happy to, to chat to anybody. Um, but it's also um, it's really important to, to support our main charity. So things like the RSPB, uh, we've got the Mammal Society, we've got Bug Life, we've got Plant Life. All of these charities have got the most amazing amount of information um, that's there for us to, to use. Um, and it sort of gives you background information and sort of some real tips on what you can do at, um, at home as well. OK, well, good luck. And let's hope that if we have this chat in a couple of years time, things have improved. Yes, fingers crossed. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right, thank you.